um, after our last speaker, uh, Dr. Rajinder Suri, who is um, has been involved in strategic planning and into in execution in large biotech companies, and he is going to share with us what are the key enablers for success from an operational and also from a policymaker standpoint. And what are the opportunities that our vaccine manufacturers should pay attention to in the broader biotech manufacturing ecosystem and in the context of the budding single African market? So, uh, Rajinda, I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kirti. Uh, at the very outset, I would like to thank uh, Kirti and uh, Professor Fraser, uh, Director Nelson Mandela School, for inviting me to such a critical uh, and important roundtable meeting and uh, raising very pertinent questions. I would also like to thank uh, my learned colleagues, uh, Chidi, Dr. Paul, and Dr. Simon, uh, who have addressed very vital issues uh, just before me, and uh, they have provided an inside out view of what is happening in Africa and what can happen. What I will attempt to do in the next few minutes is to give you an outside in glimpse. Uh, you know, it is said that any adversity brings with it an opportunity. And so is the case with COVID-19. This is no exception. Especially for Africa, I would say it has opened a plethora of opportunities because we have a population of 1.38 billion, which is equivalent to 17% of global population and a GDP of $2.5 trillion growing at a 3.4%. I think this gives a very clear opportunity area for, for Africa to manufacture for Africa in Africa. And you see the current vaccine requirement is over 1 billion doses per month which is translating into $1.6 billion public market today. And this is going to triple in the next decade. So 2030, uh, it is estimated to be $5 billion. Now, this is a huge amount of opportunity that we are talking about. While we are very, uh, you know, fully mindful of the vaccine inequities, which have uh, happened, uh, unfortunately, in the COVID, it has really been brought to the light. I also feel that it's a wake-up call for all of us uh, concerned, including the political leadership, the policymakers, investors, researchers, regulators, and manufacturers alike. So given that the political will is now there and the environment is conducive for the vaccine industry, I would say that there are four pillars of vaccine manufacturing. The technology being the first one, the infrastructure, which has been already raised by Dr. Paul and Dr. Simon also, and the investments, he mentioned about the capital, uh, you know, access to capital. And again, Dr. Paul touched about the people part of it. While a lot has been discussed and several high level plans are already underway, this is an opportune platform to go deeper into these aspects with a microscopic view on each of these. Now, just to touch you a few things, uh, you know, before we get into the question answer session, the technology, because today everybody is running after COVID-19 and MRL. But what happens when COVID goes away? By the time you have put hundreds of millions of dollar facility, and then what will you manufacture there? And therefore, you need to really have a broader bandwidth, which is not just technology or IP around that, but what is most critical is the technical know-how and the effective technology transfer so that you have a platform technology and on that you can manufacture various vaccines, not just COVID. Coming to facility, Dr. Simon touched uh, very importantly on the drug substance facility, which is equally important as much as the fill finish facility. Today, the focus is only fill finish facility in Africa, which is, I think, good because this is the first step we have to take. But we really need to plan for an end-to-end -end manufacturing value chain because the questions we need to ask, who will create this facility? Who will decide what kind of a facility? Who will design the layout? The man-material movement, 
the quality management system, the compliance to regulatory standards, and so on. All these are several questions which one has to keep in mind before getting into the facility part of it. Because erecting a facility, as uh, Dr. Simon just said, it is not just, you know, you, you create a shell and uh, it's a generic structure and you can do anything. Vaccine facilities are very precise, very specific, very, uh, you know, regulated, and therefore they have to comply to several uh, regulations. So again, uh, you know, so do we have a partner in place who will help us in uh, erecting these facilities or designing these facilities or really putting the, these facilities who will uh, finally lead to production of a certain uh, vaccine out of that? The funding part has been touched again and all of us are fully aware that what critical role the funding plays. But what is more important is not just funding, but the timely uh, investments. And then there has to be sustained funding. So we have to find innovative financing mechanism so that the load is not upfront on, on the manufacturer. And this is dispersed over a period of time so that there is a time to recover and pay back whatever loans or grants are coming in. And this will also ensure the sustainability of the plant in the longer term. The people, I think, is the most critical asset for any manufacturing facility. And today, I think this is a very, very vital question that we have to ask ourselves because there is a need of competent and trained workforce from where these people will come all of a sudden for all these facilities that we are talking about. Do we have universities and biotech institutions churning out hundreds of them every year? Who is going to train these people? And you don't just need production, guys. What you need is a complete value chain. You are talking about the quality control, the quality assurance, the engineering people, the, the supply chain people, the regulatory people, the, the quality control, quality assurance people. So it, it's it's a complete holistic long-term planning what one has to go. And there was a very good question from Farhan in the chat, uh, which was talking about the pharmacy uh, you know, schools, whether that kind of a infrastructure is required to be done. Yes, exactly. That is precisely what is required to be done. Because when the people are coming out, even if they are having certain degrees, are they having that expertise or experience to handle fermenters on their own? Can they really get into the vaccine facility? Because any one wrong move and your entire chain is finished. Because you see the clean room environment, the, the governing processes, everything is critical in a vaccine facility. It's a totally GMP, good manufacturing practices, controlled facility. So when you are entering the clean room area, you have to be fully trained how to behave, how to move, what to do, what not to do. Now, these are certain aspects which require a detailed uh, planning and execution to the hilt. Then we are talking about, uh, you know, uh, importing 99% uh, of the vaccines and 70% uh, 70, 70 of which is coming from India, which also shows the level of trust and comfort that Africa has with Indian vaccine manufacturers in terms of quality, safety, efficacy, and affordability. It is because the vaccine manufacturers in developing countries, we are breathing same air as you are doing in Africa. We fully understand and appreciate the challenges because we have gone through all that. And that's why we can really appreciate what is required to be done. And this is not long back, only a few years back we were facing the same challenges as you are now facing today. So I think uh, we, we have to have partners of choice in technology transfer, who can handhold, who can make Africa self-sufficient in the pl planned time frame. Because the need here is not filling the immunization gap. Please understand, we, we, we are not just talking of immunization gap, but the question is of, regional and national security. Because the question is asked that what opportunities could be developed in source uh, vaccine manufacturing inputs from local sources. 
So first of all, I think we need to establish collaboration. This word has been said, but with whom? With existing manufacturers who have the facilities ready, the trained workforce ready, and above all, a mindset which is ready to move in the right direction. So, in fact, I am really pleased to see that a lot of progress has already taken place with, uh, for example, Aspen signing fill finish agreement with JNJ, BioVac with Pfizer, Vaxira with Sinovac and Serum Institute, and uh, Sodema from Morocco with uh, Sinopharm in China. New facilities have to be carefully planned, and we need to have experienced partners in place before embarking on such a venture. Secondly, all vaccine manufacturers in Africa need to brainstorm and arrive at a product mix that can be manufactured locally. It's not that all the 22 vaccines or 28 vaccines that we are listing have to be manufactured necessarily. No, as a first step, let's list down what are the most critical vaccines that should be manufactured locally. And then out of these facilities, who will manufacture what rather than cannibalizing each other? And this is going to be very, very critical, very important aspect, uh, I think, uh, going forward that people will have to keep in mind that uh, who is the best in doing that than doing everything uh, and, and trying to uh, uh, you know, mix up the whole thing. So the, the point is that we have to have cost effectiveness and sustainability in mind while planning these activities. Thirdly, I think we need to develop sources for uh, raw material as also packaging material for a large majority of items within Africa or else what, will, what is going to happen? The cost of imports because of the duties, import duties coupled with the heavy freight cost will make the entire operation unviable. So a policy recommendation probably has to be uh, put in place to buy local first. That means preference in tenders has to be enshrined to local manufacturers vis-a-vis -vis imports to encourage local vaccine industry and ensure its viability and long-term sustainability. And then uh, very rightly, it has been pointed out that sustainable regulatory mechanisms have to be put in place. And Basically, there are three key success factors, the availability, the affordability, and accessibility. Particularly, I'm talking of those countries which have no vaccine manufacturing facilities. How can they collaborate? Collaboration is the key. So how will they collaborate? It could be through knowledge sharing partnerships, like R&D they can do, trained workforce they can do. They can start working on that. Material transfer partnerships are there. Like I said earlier, the uh, raw materials or the packaging materials or the medias or the vials or the stoppers, aluminum seals, thermocalls, corrugated boxes, carriers, you know, there's so hundreds of things which are, are required to be done. So different industries can manufacture different things, not necessarily vaccine. And then what is most critical for any vaccine uh, industry to succeed or vaccine still to succeed, that they have to have a accurate forecast. So these countries can provide an accurate forecast, confirmed uh, advance orders, or AMC, the assured market commitments, and timely payments, which will ensure you know, the, the wheel is running continuously without any uh, hassles. Then creating cold chain infrastructure, ultra freezer, cold rooms, temperature controlled delivery trucks, vans, bikes, the, the vaccination workforce, so these partnerships are going to be the key for public health to avoid stumbling blocks for vaccine development, deployment, and equitable access, both for COVID and of course for future pandemics. And then uh, one important thing is, uh, uh, what are the products or services uh, being procured from outside the continent? So today we, all of us uh, know that 99% of the vaccines are being procured. So it is not only just vaccines, but also everything along, uh, you know, uh, with the vaccine. That means uh, whether it is a vial or it's a stopper or it's a seal or it's a, a corrugated box or a thermocol box, everything is being imported. And these can be done internally within Africa, which will bring down the cost, make the products, uh, you know, more sustainable and uh, affordable to the, to the public. And these are called symbiotic relationships. 
So this is what is my message to you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, Raj. And that's exactly the conversation that I wanted us to get into is all those other components, right? At the moment, we're probably importing majority of all of those components. I saw some o OECD data that looked at the glass stopper, uh, sorry, the rubber stoppers and the ampules and those uh, seals and the coal boxes. And Africa was nowhere to be seen in terms of manufacturing any of those components. And I think there's immense opportunities for us to do that. And it would be interesting to understand that in all of these partnerships that have been announced, even for full and finish, or even the current vaccine manufacturers, where are they getting all of these components from? And are there import duties or taxes on, on any of those components? Or are they tax exempt? How will they be managed under the Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, you know, in terms of import duties and so on? So uh, these are all important conversations and, and also are the other non-manufacturing countries able to produce any of them locally? So I, I think that these are important questions that we need to be looking at. <laughs>